So neck of femur fractures are incredibly common in today's modern world. And as physiotherapists, we have a huge role to play. So let's take you through everything you need to know about neck of femur fractures. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So why do neck of femur fractures happen so commonly when the femur is the strongest bone in the body? Well, the fact that it's the strongest bone in the body means that the shaft of the femur itself can withstand really high forces traveling throughout the body. However, the neck of the femur is actually quite weak and that small area of bone still transmits all of that force, which unfortunately it can't always cope with when the body has a major trauma. And therefore, we get neck of femur fractures. So first of all, causes. How do these injuries happen? Well, we tend to find in the younger patient that it requires a high energy trauma to generate the force to create these fractures. So we're thinking about a fall from a great height, maybe a fall off a roof, for example, or a heavy road traffic collision. However, in the older patient, where we find that these neck of femur fractures happen most commonly, it takes a much lower energy trauma. And that's because these individuals may have weaker bone. We talk about osteopenia or osteoporosis in these individuals, meaning that simply falling whilst walking can be enough to fracture that neck of femur. So these fractures can be classified as intracapsular or extracapsular, which basically means inside the capsule of the hip or outside of the capsule of the hip. And differentiating the difference is super important when it comes to how we manage them orthopedically. And that's down to one main factor. Can you guess it? The answer is blood supply. So in adults, 90% of the blood supply to the neck and head of femur comes from the circumflex arteries, which enter via the base of the femoral neck. Therefore, if you've had a heavy intracapsular fracture, you could significantly disrupt this blood supply, which in the long term could lead to something called avascular necrosis, death of the bone due to a lack of blood supply. Therefore, these intracapsular fractures have to be managed differently to extracapsular fractures, where the blood supply may be less affected. And therefore, we have to manage these different fractures with different surgeries. So first of all, let's dive into these intracapsular fractures, which can be subclassified into the garden classification from grade one to grade four. Let's go through what these mean. So first of all, we have a garden one classification. This is where we have an incomplete fracture that doesn't necessarily travel all the way across the neck of femur, and therefore the neck of femur may still be in a valgus position, which is good. These are considered the least significant of the neck of femur fractures. Then we have the garden 2 classification. This is whereby we may have a complete fracture across the femoral neck. However, the fracture remains undisplaced and therefore everything is still in a good position. Then we have type 3 fractures. This is where we have a complete fracture across the whole of the femoral neck and we may see partial displacement of the femoral head where it's not angulated in the right direction. Then we will have the garden 4 classification where we have a complete fracture and we have complete displacement of the femoral neck. It's totally in the wrong position and this is considered the most significant of those fractures. So with your garden one and garden two classification, where there's less displacement, it is suggested that the blood supply will be less affected. Therefore, we can still use the majority of the original bone and the orthopedic management may well be the insertion of two to three cannulated screws, as you can see here. However, with your garden three and garden four classification, where we have significant displacement, this suggests that there would also be significant blood supply disruption. Therefore, the original bone may be incredibly vulnerable and you tend to find that these injuries are managed with a hemiarthroplasty, half a hip replacement, or a full total hip replacement, a full arthroplasty where the whole joint is replaced. So an easy way you can remember this is with the phrase 1-2 screw, 3-4 Austin Moore. With garden 1 and garden 2, we would normally use cannulated screws. Now an Austin Moore is a specific type of hip replacement that was developed by a surgeon called Austin Moore. And therefore, it can help you remember that garden 3 and garden 4 injuries are commonly managed with some form of hip replacement. 
So next we have extracapsular fractures, and these are defined as fractures that occur outside of the capsule of the hip joint. Now these are subdivided into intratrochanteric fractures and subtrochanteric fractures. This is based on the line of the trochanters, the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter of the femur. So intertrochanteric, you can imagine that this means between the two trochanters, as you can see on the screen here, and these are commonly managed by a dynamic hip screw. Then we have subtrochanteric fractures, ones that occur below the level of the trochanters, and these are commonly managed with an intermedullary nail, which can then move into the shaft of the femur to stabilize the fracture. That's how we classify these fractures, and this is how they're managed surgically. Now, what do we do as physiotherapists? So you're seeing this patient day one on the ward after their surgery. What do we do? Well, the first steps has got to be speaking to the nursing staff, speaking to the medical team and checking the post-op notes. This is where we may well find the weight bearing status for this patient, how they're allowed to mobilize immediately after their surgery. Now, for most patients, they will be allowed to weight bear as tolerated or fully weight bear, whereby we may still use aids such as a walking frame or crutches, but effectively they're allowed to put as much weight through their leg as they feel they can. However, look out for your cannulated hip screw surgeries. Commonly, these patients may be asked to partially weight bear for around six to eight weeks first. And it's important that we're aware of that before we start walking the patient. So then we'll assess the patient. We'll look at their bedside observations. We'll ask how they're feeling. We'll make sure they're feeling good enough to do this. We then are gonna look at pain management. Is the patient's pain under enough control to allow them to do physiotherapy with us today? We'll also look at sensation within their leg. Can they feel their leg? And crucially, can they feel their foot when it's touching the floor when they're walking? And of course, we'll have a look at their range of movement and crucially their power to make sure that they're strong enough to start walking with us. So then we try and take our session in stages to get our patient up to mobilizing. We might simply start by transferring to the edge of the bed. How does the patient feel? Do they feel ready to keep going? Then we'll try standing up for the first time. Naturally, this is going to be worrying to the patient, but it's great to give them that boost to show them that they can put weight through their leg. Then, of course, we'll start taking some steps. Now, this could be initially taking a few steps just to get into the chair, or it could be walking a few meters more. Of course, we're going to use a specific walking aid, whether it be something like a relator frame or crutches or even one crutch. And we'll be trying to progress the patient through the next three days onto less and less walking aids to allow them to go home. And then, of course, exercises. Now, whilst in hospital in the first few days, these are likely to be less intensive. It may be things like leg extensions or something like a straight leg raise or something like bridging, which they can still do whilst they're in bed. And then naturally, as time progresses and they become more functionally aware, we can do things like standing on one leg or sit to stand practice or simple movements like hip abduction or hip extension. And of course, these are all things that you can take that patient through on their journey to giving them a stronger and more functional hip. So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this review. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. Remember, we've got some incredible webinars to further support your knowledge, such as a neck of femur fractures full webinar itself, as well as other webinars such as inpatient orthopedic assessment. And you can find all of these on our membership website, member.clinicalphysio.com. Remember, we've also got our Instagram account at Clinical Physio and the website clinicalphysio.com. But for now, thank you so much for watching. I'm Khalid. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.